The chair would like to call tonight to, to order tonight's regular meeting of the CUSD 201 Board of Education, July 17, 2018. Roll call, please. Mr. Armstrong. Here. Mrs. Charlton. Here. Mrs. Coyle. Mr. Price. Mr. Rudy. Here. Mr. Strohmeyer. Here. Ms. Wilson. Here. Thank you. We could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, the first item is approval of minutes. And actually, I have something I wanted to add to the minutes. Um, all right. On page two, under um, the dual language report update, um, I would like us to add a little bit um, to that um, because basically it just says that um, Mr. Weiler provided the board with an update. Um, if we could put something in there, like the board had a discussion about the dual language program, and it would be, uh, it was decided that it would be brought up at the next meeting. You know, something more than just. That was a lengthy discussion. I agree. There it be was, a little, yeah. A little bit more. So I'd like to. So maybe if we could um, work on that between now and the next one, and okay. add something to it. And um, the same thing for the benchmark uh, advanced ELA curriculum. Um, it is listed as an action item, which, which it was, but I would like to put something in there that there was a discussion between the board and the administration um, about this. And again, you know, um, especially for newer board members, the minutes are never supposed to be uh, an exact duplicate of what happened, but uh, there should be, uh, you know, some discussion. So maybe you and I could okay. do that All before right. the next one. So we, were, well, we won't be approving that one. So we'll approve that next time. Okay, for the closed session, anybody have anything on that one? Oh. The chair will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the closed session of the June 19, 2018 regular meeting of the Board of Education as presented. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carried. Are there any public comments? Okay, we will move to the consent agenda. Any questions on that before we go? The chair will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Number one, personnel recommendation. Employment of licensed staff, Joshua Strand, English teacher, Westmont High School. Stipend position, Joshua Strand, department coordinator, Westmont High School. Dan McCullough, interim athletic director, Westmont High School. John Natanek, girls senior varsity basketball coach, Westmont High School. Deja Thomas, Palms dance coach, Westmont High School. Two, disposal of equipment. Three, approval of Westmont High School pool rental with Bennett Academy. Four, approval of Westmont High School pool rental with Academy Bullets. Five, approval of Westmont High School pool rental with Ultimate Swimming. Six, adoption of prevailing wage resolution. Seven, renewal of SELF, Workman's Compensation Insurance. Eight, approval of board travel expenses. Nine, approval of additional June 2018 expenditure report. Ten, ratification of June 2018 regular payroll. And eleven, approval of July 2018 expenditure report. So moved. Second. Okay. Roll call, please. Mr. Armstrong. Yes. Mr. Rudy. Yes. Mr. Strohmeyer. Yes. Ms. Wilson. Yes. Mrs. Charlton. Yes. Thank you. Okay, motion carried. Okay, the first item for information discussion is Westmont Junior High School's plan for social emotional learning with educational assistance dog. And we have Mr. Jonak here with us today. Yes. I do have a presentation. So we'll so move we, to the other end of We'll move. Well, we can stay. Yeah. You guys can stay. <laughs> Um, if, uh, maybe if they can see, they can see it a little bit better. It'll look a lot better on camera. In the dark? Be closer. Okay. Uh, 
Hi, and uh, welcome. So I'm John Jonak, principal of Westmont Junior High School. Thank you for having me. Uh, the reason why I'm, I'm uh, approaching the board tonight is so that they could um, hear a little bit about this program that I'm proposing. And, um, and I, you should have received a little bit of uh, information in advance. So it, we are constantly trying to figure out ways to improve the climate, uh, this, the, the academics, the social emotional learning that's going on at Westmont Junior High School. And so I believe I've came up, came up with another plan in, in order to do that. So we all know that there's in, in the news there's there's a lot of a lot of difficult things going on for our youth. Parkland is that um, the the shootings that are going on, the problems with social media. Um, so so what we're constantly looking for are ways that we can make school uh, a positive place. And so one of the one of the issues that we're seeing is that there's there's a, a rising degree of mental illness with our students, and this could this could be uh, you know high levels of mental illness or or maybe some more subtle things. <clears throat> so what are we currently doing at Westmont Junior High School? We have a relationship with Hope for the Day, and they're about positive mental health and suicide prevention. And they did quite a bit with us last year in year one. Uh, we're continuing to grow that relationship uh, in the years to come. We've done uh, training with our teachers and our students on resiliency, and then also had parent universities. We're doing mental health training on a workshop at the beginning of the year this year through Hope for the Day as well. We're taking steps to become a trauma-informed school our social work, uh, our social worker, Amanda Winter, she works with our, our students, whether it's resource minutes, but then also in groups and individually. And then she also has been doing a lot of social emotional, touching the social emotional learning standards during our STAR time or resource time uh, through Second Step. We have a more proactive approach with the student service learning commitment, and that's you're, you're all aware because you approved it. That's where our, parent, our students are going out and performing over, over the course of three years, 36 hours plus of community service. Um, and that's local and, and that is worldwide as well, community service. And we're doing so much more. But we know that our students and our families, I mean, just, just uh, not a week and a half ago, one of our families what, you know, lost their father. Right, and and there are things that are going on that are that are hitting our community and our world deep down, and so we constantly need to be looking at what we're doing and figure out ways that we can continue to improve. So there needs to be more, and so here's the breakdown, because I figure I'll get a lot of questions, so um, so I'll just kind of give you the skinny. My proposal is that Westmont Junior High School will improve the climate and contribute to the social emotional learning by adding a properly mannered and trained educational assistance dog to the school environment. So the basic information, we like the who, what, when, where, why type stuff. So, so what, we would, I would select and train through trainers an educational assistance dog. It would be myself and the dog, along with the help of trainers. And this would take place depending on the selection of the dog and the approval of the Board of Education. This would happen between the uh, fall of 2018 and spring of 2020. It would be a long process. And it would take place at the junior high. The dog would provide positivity, motivation for our students and our staff. And then we would be growing academically and socially. Because I think we all know that if a student is feeling safe at school, uh, they're going to be learning better, right? Um, so how we're going to be working with staff, students, community, and networking around with other schools and ministries that have already walked this path. So what have they learned through this process and what can we do that's going to mirror the positive things and what can we do to mitigate the things that are not working so well? And so the recommendation uh, given to me by another administrator in Arkansas, Andy Pennington, uh, is that we go through first the, the breed selection. So it needs to be, in order for this to work and work well, um, there's different layers going on in, in different states and different schools. So some, some states are just bringing in regular shelter dogs that do a quick temperament test and there's little to no training and they bring them into schools and they've seen great success in that. Just New York started with seven dogs. They're up to 37 dogs just last year. So 37 dogs, 37 schools. For this starting in DuPage County and trying to keep in mind everything and really kind of this being the first in the Midwest, the goal would be to breed, to, to work with a breeder, to choose a breed that is going to uh, lack the shedding, 
uh, and not induce those allergies as well. And then also has a great temperament for the kind of work that we're looking for. So that would take place first, then the selection, and then the initial um, uh, puppy school. Sounds like somebody else needs a puppy school. Uh, and then the dog would first start in just the office area. And over a period of time going through the CGC, the Canine Good Citizen Training, um, it would be like a gradual release. So it's not going to be anything that the dog's just thrust into classes right away. And eventually the dog would earn a vest and a ribbon. And then there would be enhanced training from there. Depending on the area and the, the trainers that we have and the curriculum that's out there, there's everything from, in North Carolina, the Educational Assistance Dog Program that has multiple levels of licensure, um, all the way to therapy dog training, all the way to, um, to assisted, uh, assisted uh, living dogs. So there's, there's quite a bit. So as you can see, there's quite a timeline there. And then um, I did share with you just a little bit in regards to um, some of the, the, the things that we're seeing, um, the social, emotional things that we're seeing. So I, I, I gave you a packet of that information along with some of the good things that are going on in schools. This is not, uh, th this is kind of a new idea for this area, for DuPage area, uh, but it is, we're, we're not setting the trends here. Uh, this has been very successful in other schools. Um, and then I also included, I believe, the board policy for one of the schools that has been doing this. So I've already been reaching out uh, to some potential po uh, partners uh, for us. And we've got, and what the idea is to reach out to local. So everything that would be done, we would have a local vet and uh, Dr. Jessica Tor Torak from Urban Veterinary Associates. Um, Amy, Amy uh, Bussey, I believe I dropped a Y off of her name, from Dogs in Harmony is one of the point of contact trainers that we would look at, although there's other trainers that we would look at. Pet Supplies Plus has already said, um, if you do this program, we would be interested in uh, supplying with the grooming and, uh, and the trimming of the dog, which uh, one of the dogs we're looking at is a golden doodle, and uh, that's gonna be quite a bit of trimming going on. Um, and then <laughs> Pet Partners, uh, is, an, is an organization along with Animal Assisted Interaction um, uh, International. These are some that they're in, into the training, training into the curriculum, into um, getting dogs certified. And there's more to come. So the whole idea is that the, the dog, everything that is done for the dog, uh, the vet, all, all of the shots, everything needs to be on file with not just the local veterinarian, but the school district as well. Let me make sure I make this clear. The dog primarily would have, to have a dual function. The dog would be my dog, my family dog, but it would be getting trained up to be a, a therapy dog, an assisted, uh, an educational assisted dog here at Westmont Junior High School. Um, and so, so we would be making sure that, uh, that all of the medical stuff, all the veterinary stuff is there for parents to see, for the board to see, to have fine file with the district. And then just some possible types of training that we, these are just a list of possible trainings that we would be looking at. And with that, I open it up for questions. Well, I certainly like this idea. I know that uh, I've had a niece that's had some health issues and uh, anytime the, they bring in the, uh, the dogs to the hospital, I mean, the, the whole building lights up. Okay, I mean, it, sure. it, it's definitely a change in, in attitude. So I'm, I'm certainly for the most part on board with it. Um, so would the dog be coming to school every day? So yes, once, you know, first and, and for Obviously, those, right. I'm talking down there. Eventually the... You got it. So we need to make sure that the proper vaccinations are done and such because we don't want to harm the dog as well. But once that is done, um, yes, the dog would be coming. It would need to go through a puppy training and make sure that uh, we're, we're not having accidents. They just did the carpet, so we want to make sure we're good to go in that way. So the basic training needs to occur. As the dog is going through the CGC training, it would be in the office area. So once again, it would be in the office. Gradual release is that it would be moving as it continues to gain those certifications. It would be mo moving out into uh, out, in, out into the, uh, the classrooms, the, you know, we would walk around the commons, go to gym. Uh, uh, when they're in the lit students are in the literacy lounge and reading, we could be sitting down and, and, uh, and reading as well. Um, so that, that, that's what I see, see happening in the future. So the dog would be with you at almost all times. It wouldn't yes, be like the, the dog beginning. would just be wandering around or anything Correct. Like that. In the beginning, the dog would be with me on a leash at all times. Uh, as the trainings continue, 
Um, I will get trained so that I can train others. And once a faculty or a staff member gets trained through me, the idea down the road, and once again, we need to see what works for Westmont Junior High School and the temperament of the dog and all of that. But um, but down the road, I see kind of a sign-out system going on uh, for the dog. If a teacher has been trained and they want to go with the classroom into, yep, you got it. I also see, just a, because uh, it kind of se- segues into this, uh, there's opportunities to earn time with the dog. So if you know we're having a student that's perhaps coming in late, uh, I've seen this work really well as an incentive program that you know they, they might be able to do something with the dog <coughs> if they start showing up on time a little bit. Um, it's been it's worked really well in social skills type situations uh, for students, behavior plans, um, uh, calming sometimes in disciplinary situations. There's calming that needs to happen. We have great great kids, but you know, we have we every once in a while we we need to kind of uh, get centered a little bit and calm down. Uh, and then also, you know, as I was kind of hinting at before. Um, unfortunately, tough situations happen to our students and our staff. And so that is another, that's just one more thing that, uh, that, that we can do that will hopefully um, provide some comfort, not everything, but some comfort to our, our students, our staff, you know. Okay. And one thing that you haven't mentioned in here at all, and I hate to be this guy, but uh, what about costs? Sure. So the uh, so the, the way that uh, the Arkansas school, Andy, is doing it, uh, uh, is different than how I would do it. Um, so he had, he had said that this is a full time. This is not the first dog that they brought into their district. So it it is a long term um, uh, mm-hmm. program within the district because they've already seen the benefits for it. And his was the second dog. Um, the cost the dog. You know it, anybody that knows Golden Doodles and and getting somebody that's a good breeder and genetic testing. They're pretty costly. Uh, because the dog is a dual purpose dog, but primarily mine, uh, I would pay the cost of the of the dog. So, um, so you know, buying that dog, the dog from the breeder would be my cost, my family's cost. Uh, taking care of the 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 food would be mine as well. The grooming, like I said, we've we've got somebody that would do that. We're looking at sponsors as well. I've already reached out um, to a couple individuals just to, to look into is if there's any interest. The idea is that the dog is going to be gaining a vest as he goes up or she goes up in the certification process. And I've, I've reached out to a couple saying we could work out something, whether you know there's some sort of sponsorship in which uh, you take care of the veterinarian costs, which the veterinarian already said that you would give us a discounted cost. Uh, as far as the service, but um, you know, if you if your uh, organization takes care of the veterinary costs for a year, you know that's a sponsorship or something along those lines. I know that Arkansas, what they do is they have fundraisers. So the student council will do a Saturday read in the park with uh, the dog's name is Honey, and so uh, they'll be out there and they'll just kind of put the money in there. They'll put it into a, a, an account, an activity account at the school. And that that pays for any additional uh, veterinary cost or um, or training costs as well, because training costs money, and, and mm-hmm. you know the trainers need to make make a life of <coughs> themselves. John, I um, have two questions. Yes. One, um, I have a golden doodle. So what do you think about him? It is the best dog. <laughs> really, seriously, anyone who's been to my house, she is great with kids. She's great with my grandkids. Uh, very good tempered dog. So I'm. I, I, happy that that's kind of what you're thinking of. Obviously, every dog is different. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and the other thing is, I'm a dog person, and I love dogs. Mm-hmm. But I imagine, and I'm sure that this has come up, that there might be some students who are afraid of dogs. Mm-hmm. You got it. I imagine that you there's something that w- would be put in place for just people that don't like dogs. Absolutely. So currently, we have something <coughs> called a, a media release form that our, our parents get to um, Put down that they don't want any pictures of their of their student, their child, um, on websites or released in any sort of way. And it would be the same sort of thing. There would be quite a bit. You know, obviously we're aware um, that communication is the key, and so we'd um, be broadcasting that this is a program that we're looking at. Uh, we would have an evening in which the parents could come out and meet the dog. The kids could come out as well. We probably have a few of those. Um, and, uh, and just check the temperaments and all that. And by the way, we would be having a trainer go with us for the breed for the dog selection um, at, uh, at seven, seven weeks old. That's the perfect time to go and figure out the, the temperament and the tendencies of a dog. 
Um, but we would do those things as well and then make a list. And then, you know, obviously if uh, we'll just come up with a name, Jill, if Jill, uh, Jill's parents and Jill do, do not really want to have interactions with the dog, then we'll, we'll make sure that that doesn't happen. And if uh, like Dr. Burasak, who happens to be like this amazing dog person, uh, if she has Jill in her class, then for that class, they're, they're not going to be reading with the dog in uh, the literacy lounge. So we want to honor the fact, and uh, <coughs> just because we're handling the hypoallergenic and the little to no shedding piece uh, does not mean that there's not other things that we need to keep in mind. I have a question also. Would the training be one-on-one -on -one with you and the dog, or is it in a group? So the training would happen at different levels. So I'm, I'm, uh, that's a great question. I'm not yet a dog trainer. Uh, I'm, I'm I guess I'm going to, instead of becoming a, a, a superintendent one day, I guess I'll, <laughs> I'll work on that certification process. Uh, but but uh, in, we, we would be working with multiple trainers because the idea is that this is going to start in Westmont, but you're all very much aware that um, I facilitate a professional learning network of principals in the local area, and they want to see what we do with this and to kind of extend out. So I have a lot of trainers that are interested in this program, not just from here, but ranging everywhere from, from Chicago all the way over to Batavia. Um, and so, so the different trainers, I'm going to be leaning on their expertise. Uh, from what I heard from Andy and uh, Honey, uh, they do have different parts that are going to be like CGC, the Canine Good Citizen uh, certification. That's done one-on-one. -on -one. But as you grow into the whole facility dog type certification process, you need to see how the dog interacts in a facility. And so um, certain parts of it are going to be done at the, in the summer, uh, you know, at, on the premises. And then certain things, we're going to extend it out over, over time. Would the dog start at school as a puppy, or? So the cert the, um, the the making sure that the right immunizations are done is very important. Um, I just saw a six month old uh, golden doodle about two days ago, uh, and um, and she's already at a pretty good size. Uh, typically, teenage dogs are about nine months old, somewhere around nine months old. So I get ahead the teenage years within a year, um, but uh, um, but we want to make sure. I don't want us to give a set time um, because I want to make sure that we're following all the steps. I want to do this right because I really see this setting the precedent for a lot of programs in the future. So if the, if the dog uh, is in, as, as, a, as a puppy ready to go just to the office and I check with Mr. Carey, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm reporting back, I'm taking a look at different things, um, then we'll make that call. But we, we'll make that call uh, with great communication to the parents, to the board, to, to Mr. Carey, um, uh, and, uh, and also the staff and the students. Um, but we want to work with the trainers on all of that. Thank They're you. the professionals. So. John, to your knowledge at this point, are all of your staff on board? Um, we, uh, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, so last year, um, somebody said we need to get a dog and uh, and I have not pulled my entire staff I wanted to talk to you uh, I talked to mr. Carey about five months ago and then I talked to my other and my other superintendent Tanya Jonak who is my wife uh, <laughs> she, she put the pause on it uh, do you like how I did that uh, nice, she nice. put the pause yes. on it for a little bit I didn't mean to and uh, and and so I wanted to make sure things could move forward so if if this is something that the board is interested in um, then I would be reaching out to my staff as well. But from what I can tell, uh, they are definitely a dog-friendly staff. And my other question would be, once the dog is, is trained, uh, a canine good citizen, and ready to be a facility animal in your facility, is there opportunity then to, for lack of a better way to say it, test the waters at Manning and Miller and South and the high school and take the dog for a day with you and go there and, and absolutely utilize. I know they used reading dogs mm -hmm. at Miller um, just because of my son's experience there. Yes, but just to kind of test the waters to see if it's something that is. I I would be happy to do that. Um, I did mention at the last uh, admin meeting that we had uh, that this was something I'm looking at. I had to kind of bite my lip for a while on it. Sure. Um, but uh, but I did mention it to them and. 
Um, so we would have to see. I don't want to speak for the other administrators. I do see a benefit to it. It doesn't necessarily mean uh, I've seen a lot of a lot of districts and schools doing it in different ways, not here in the state of Illinois, um, in which it's uh, maybe the math teacher or maybe the, maybe the social worker or, or whatnot. Um, uh, and, and by the way, I, I did, it, it wouldn't be the first time that we had a dog. So uh, there was somebody on the SACID staff in our deaf and hard of hearing program uh, four years ago that had a, um, a comfort dog. And so we, you know, the, it, the halls were, were, you know, we've had dogs before and I had never heard one negative thing. Um, it's uh, more so about brightening up. Now the difference between that comfort dog and, and what this plan is, is that uh, the comfort dog is when it's wearing its vest, it is only to be touched by, by the dog or by the person that brings it in. Um, this would not be that case. Right. You know, I'd, I'd be out on bus duty, and you know, people would be coming out, and you know, the shared experience. You got it. So uh, one concern you address, but I would like a little more consideration, is for allergies. Mm -hmm. um, as a recent dog acquirer. Uh, I did test uh, the golden doodle and I have allergies and my children have allergies so I'm curious what the research is showing sure. some of the, the rescue dogs and the, the golden doodle as a hypo a version of a hypoallergenic but maybe not you mm -hmm. know? so I, there could be some allergens that are being brought into the school I imagine there'll be some people infected by that yes um, so there's uh, there's there's uh, multiple classifications of uh, golden doodle specifically uh, and there's there's many um, other breeds that have been doodleized as well I, I'll call it for lack of a better term um, the the f1 is a dog that is um, half um, golden retriever and then half uh, poodle and so so that is still going to have it's going to have less an allergic reaction but it's but it is still going to have yeah it's it's people are still going to be sensitive to that um, a golden doodle is uh, about as because it's 75 percent um, if i'm saying this correctly yes 75 percent um, poodle and uh, 25 percent golden and so because of that, that poodle, that 75%, uh, it, it's significant that uh, it's about the least hypo, or the, the most hypoallergenic dog that, that you can find, uh, except for a hairless dog. Um, hairless dogs are a little bit different. So that is something that we're keeping in mind. I do have um, one faculty member that has significant allergies and she has been fine with F1Bs. Um, so she's kind of my litmus test. But, uh, but with that being said, that's part of the reason why I was so excited to hear uh, from Pets Plus because, um, you know, that having the dog regularly groomed yep. and, uh, and trimmed and all of that is going to be essential for the success of the entire program. Um, when I talked to a couple of the principals in New York City, they explained that it was a non-issue. Um, and these were dogs that were not hypoallergenic. Um, typically, a lot of therapy dogs are Labrador Retrievers and Golden Golden Goldens, and um, and I don't hear too much. However, the dogs are typically for therapy or uh, for comfort dogs are typically there only for two hours. But uh, in the you can look up on YouTube the amount of therapy dogs that are in schools and because they're covering so much area. Um, it, it typically is not an issue. Are you? Do you have a preference to a male or female, or is there a preference among the schools that they have better luck with? Or so I um, I brought this up. I, I my entire life I've just had female dogs, and that's what I I, I, I prefer. Um, but uh, I brought this up to my friend, the principal over at Butler Junior High, um, Amy Reed, because she has uh, a comfort dog, or not a comfort dog, a therapy dog. She goes around to different schools. She's actually brought her dog into school at one time as well. And, uh, and, and uh, I believe it's Buddy. Uh, Buddy, who has his own webpage and everything, by the way, and she was on the news, big whoopee-doo. Um, but, uh, but Buddy has uh, 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 quite a following and is a male, and she told me that everything that I thought about female to male dogs is, is incorrect. So um, there's, there's some breeds that, uh, that there are, there's a lineage of some of the, the males and the females that have um, therapy kind of in their blood as well. And so those are dogs that we're looking at. Okay. 
I don't know if I answered your question or not. I'm trying to be open. I, I think I'd, I'd rather go female, but Amy Amy Reed would kill me for saying that. I think that. it probably depends on who the breeder and who you feel is a good pick. So, John, as far as you know, there are no state laws against this. Obviously, if there's been comfort dogs in the buildings, but there are differences between comfort dogs and therapy dogs. So is there any state law that would deny there, this? There is not. This is something that is going on um, in central Illinois. Um, so there is a group in Peoria that works through AAII. Um, I don't have... Okay. Um, right here, Animal Assisted Interaction International. They're, they're an organization called CPI, and they've placed multiple dogs, um, and they're not even hypoallergenic dogs, um, but they've had great success. And this all is, as far as terms of Gary Brett of legality, this all is covered under ADA. Correct. Correct. Yeah. If, um, you know, it, I, I was in the military, a lot of you are, are, are aware of that. If for some reason I needed a comfort dog or something along those lines, um, that would be, that would be covered in that. So this is that, that's, that's, I bring that up only because uh, I think it answers your question as well. It's important that the board have a policy and that's why I wanted to include and now keeping in mind that that policy is one from from Arkansas uh, but uh, but we would need to take a look at that as well if the board would consider moving forward on that in the future and see what that looks like for Illinois but I would be willing to reach out for, to the Board of Education that is down south north in the Peoria area to see what they have specifically and with a reasonably written policy for the dog at the junior high would cover the, the district and allow us. I would assume that I should know, but if we have a policy regarding service animals. I would say we yeah. just do it yeah. in the okay. district. Yeah. Yep. Any other questions? I think it sounds great. So thank you. Okay. All right, yes, thank you very much. When you go pick it out, can I go with you? <laughs> we'll, work on that. we'll work on that. <laughs> I will put Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Sure. So um, there's nothing on the agenda to approve this. Is this something we're going to do later? Right. That would be okay. something that, um, you know, if the board, if the consensus of the board is that they'd like to move forward with it, then um, we'd be working on developing the board policy okay. and then uh, approving a board policy and then uh, approving the program. Okay. And we'll look for that at another date. Okay. Uh, dual language program report update. Um, and originally, uh, Tim Weiler was planning on being here, um, and then uh, he shared with me that it was his son's birthday uh, tonight, and so I said, I can, I can manage this. But uh, when I touch base, Marie and I always touch base in, in the afternoon of a board meeting to see if either one of us had heard anything, if we're expecting anything out of the ordinary. <laughs> and uh, she asked about the, the dual language update, and I said, well, there really isn't much change there. If you look at the numbers, they're pretty much the same numbers that Tim presented. So we're kind of in a holding pattern. We haven't had any additional families request dual language program. We haven't had any new families in the district. But I mentioned that what I really want to touch base with the board on is, you know, kind of the what if in terms of the um, uh, monolingual kindergarten at uh, Miller because of its numbers. And... Uh, uh, where he said, well, is this going to be something we're going to see in writing or are you just going to share this information? I said, well, my plan was to share the information. And she said, well, you know, I think it's better if we start putting these things in writing so the board can kind of review it and take a look at it. And so I apologize for that. And going forward, I can make sure that uh, we handle it that way. But basically, I did send out a memo this afternoon, and it's uh, attached in the board book. I put it in your black folder. But uh, essentially what's going on with kindergarten then is uh, Manning um, currently has a total of 58 students registered for kindergarten, and that's uh, subtracting out the ones that already are, have been assigned to dual language. 
Um, <clears throat> of the 58, there are seven who have indicated that they would like the dual language program around the waiting list. Um, if you remember, Tim shared uh, last month that typically at registration, which is August 7th, we'll pick up one or two more Spanish speaking students for kindergarten that would automatically be placed in the dual language program. So assuming that that plays out, um, he believes three of the seven um, on the waiting list would be placed in the dual language program. And so essentially Manning then would be looking at 55 student, kindergarten students over three sections. And so that puts the average class size 18 and 19, which you know obviously is ideal. You know We couldn't have asked for better numbers. <clears throat> Miller is a little bit different story. We have 32 students who are enrolled at kindergarten um, at uh, Miller. And again, that's already subtracting out those students who already are placed in the dual language program. Uh, Tim has five students who are on the wait list. And Tim believes two of the five, if, all, if the trends play out like he's uh, predicting, that uh, two of the five would end up on the dual language program. <clears throat> so that puts the one section of kindergarten at 30. And so one of the things I asked Tim to do, we've done this in the past, um, some of our board members remember we had the reverse problem a few years ago. We were seeing large numbers entering kindergarten at Manning, and we were having smaller numbers. And so one of the um, first um, sh things we would do is just seek, see if any families would um, at Miller would opt to go attend Manning. Would they like to see their child attend Manning? <clears throat> and so uh, Tim reached out to uh, some families, and uh, four families are considering it. Um, he uh, doesn't know yet for sure what they will do. But in a best case scenario, even if four students opt to go to Manning, we're still looking at 26 students in the uh, monolingual kindergarten. And uh, again, something that our veteran board members know when we were kind of struggling with this, okay, when do you split a section? When do you add a section? Uh, we did come up with um, guidelines for class sizes. That's also included in your board book and in your folder. And again, um, when we did this um, as a board, the, they stressed that these are guidelines, it's not board policy, because there's other factors that drive the decision making. You have to have the financial resources, you have to have the available space to accommodate it. And so these are um, what's recommended by the National Council of Teachers, um, what the recommended class size is, and then when we as a district would consider splitting it. And so as you can tell, 23 is kind of, we're right there. You know, we have 26 projected, um, and we're at uh, 23. And so there, there's a couple of options uh, that we could do. One is, and we've used this option in other years, um, because there is, uh, uh, you know, right, right now, at least in our area, we hear about a teaching shortage, but in DuPage County, um, that is not the case. But uh, typically, we, there are still uh, qualified teachers who are available who haven't been able to get a full-time teaching job. We can hire that person as a teaching assistant, and because they have that licensure, they can actually you know, pull groups of students out, work independently with them because they have the proper licensure. Um, if you go that route, then we don't need to purchase any additional materials. Um, that is a, sol a solution that's sustainable long-term. and. Um, uh, by long term, what I'm meaning, what I mean there is, um, <clears throat> Miller has enough space to add one classroom. And, but if this is not just one bubble, but rather this is a trend, um, Miller can't accommodate a third section of every grade. Uh, Manning can't accommodate a fourth section of every grade. You know, so if we wanted to flip dual language to, to Manning, for instance, um, and so. Uh, you know that's why you know when I look at sustainability, um, we are in the process of getting new projections for our district, and uh, you know we're I'm I'm pretty confident by our April or our August board meeting we'll have those that data, um, and essentially what the projections do is they look at cohort survival, which is you know as students move through your district, how likely are they to remain with you, and then also birth rates in the county over several years to kind of project where you're going to be and they they create different models for the district to consider another option would be we could add a section of kindergarten at miller um, then we would essentially have two sections of 13 and obviously room for additional students um, right now uh, we had Mount mary ellen jasper who uh, retired 
Um, we weren't anticipating that. And because of individuals within the district wanting to move into first grade and then a special ed teacher wanted to move over to take that spot, we essentially did not use that, replace that FTE. So technically on the shelf, we still have uh, 1.0 available. Um, in addition to the teacher, um, if you remember, we adopted a new ELA series, a new math series. And so uh, for the ELA, um, it would be an additional $4,000 cost. Math, just because of the way the resources work, it's actually, we just have to worry about the teacher's materials. It'd be a $40 cost. Um, I touched base with Mike and uh, he believes we have enough chairs for an additional classroom. He's gonna be checking on the tables. Um, but essentially, you know, we would be hiring a new teacher at a lower salary. Uh, the savings between that teacher and Mary Ellen, we'd be able to, you know, purchase those materials and um, get those tables. And then, uh, and again, you know, if this is just a bubble, you know, we'll just keep moving that one class through the building and we don't have to worry about it, it's sustainable. But if this is a trend that looks like we're gonna be seeing, then this will help us through year one, but then um, based upon those projections that we received this year, we'll have to take a look at long range plan for accommodating larger class sizes. That's what's being projected for us. Uh, yeah, Kevin and I talked today and um, I, I'm happy we got all these things here. Um, a couple of things, well, obviously there's a lot of things to talk about, but um, one of the issues with all this is that we have, it's still unknown because we don't know what these four families might do. We haven't had registration yet. And, you know, um, a number of board members have worked the different registrations and every year we get kindergartners. So um, I know I personally have, um, you know, that's nothing's certain yet. We don't know. So we could have more, we could have 30 or more kids. Um, and so I had asked to have this memo put together because of that. And, you know, we, in the past we had a problem because we didn't have the space for, you know, mm -hmm. for this, right. you know, um, I, you know, my own son had like 32 kids in his second grade class and everything. So I was really happy about this. Um, and then strangely enough, um, you know, the way things work, this, I get this thing in the mail and Kevin, you probably get it too. Um, digestive bill right, passed. Right. I just happened to pick it up today and um, seriously just happened to pick it up today and they're saying that um, according to the state they want to by the year 2021 have 18 kids in a class for kindergarten um, I know I know, I I know. Hope the funding comes with that well handy. it says <laughs> you know it what says, does um, that they say that to provide resources but the thing that made me happy at least seeing this was that that we addressed this issue years ago and he, talking to other people in DuPage County that have bigger class sizes I know I was very happy that we had this as a recommendation for a, a guideline so um, which now then obviously brings us to where we are um, I personally I would have real trouble with 30 kids in a class um, <coughs> and with a teacher's aide because I just think that's too much on the teacher it's too much on teacher's aide and it's not a, I don't think it's a good um, in, no, you know place you. place for the students so from my perspective you know I think we're in you know it, what we've been brought are two options I don't know any other options because part of the problem is it's July already and we're this is a tough place to be in right. where we started talking about this a couple months ago um, so you know my own personal opinion is we can't have 30 kids in a class and again what we do for one school we do for another so you know when we're having 18 19 in one school we can't go over that um, but just a couple of logistic things here is that we have a meeting tonight and then we don't have another meeting till August 14th, which is two weeks before school starts. So I don't really know what the plan would be because the board obviously has to take some kind of action because we'd be spending money. Well, um, 
what basically if, if the consensus of the board is yes we you know the consensus is to uh, add another section at Miller we can post for that go through the interview process um, you know offer a teacher position and then and do all the other things in the meantime and then at the August 14th board meeting that person would be board approved okay. and we'd be in place for that okay so I just wanted to talk about the logistics yeah. on that but obviously I would love to you know have a discussion with um, and and again we have because it's July we have a couple board members who are who are not here tonight so I just I really really could not might personally have think about 30 kids in a class so I know that in the past we, we did do that with some of the younger grades and uh, my, my children with some of those classes obviously and uh, uh, obviously they got a uh, you know quality education but I know I would have been a lot more comfortable as a parent if, if we were able to at that time have split you know and created a new section which we obviously could not have done at that time it's just uh, the building just would not did not have the classrooms but uh, especially in kindergarten um, I, the teacher's aid's a fine idea I would much rather just split it into, a, into another section now then we don't have to ask those Miller families to, to move to Manning right and we're gonna we're, we all know we're <laughs> a couple a couple of kids at, at, uh, at registration I mean, it happens every year pretty much in every grade level right I mean you, you, you get a, a couple students here and a couple students there I mean it happens so I know myself personally I would feel better with uh, the, the second option of, of splitting right now and I, I know it's not a long-term solution um, I would much rather treat it as a this year problem until we see reports about you know you know furthering that way and then then we'll have to make you know different decisions but at least we'll then have a school year of planning to be able to to come up with a better plan uh, I just especially the age of these kids are going to be kindergarten kids I, I I think that's a a lot of kids in one classroom even for for two teachers to handle so mm -hmm. that's just my opinion I agree also and I um, a lot of the kids don't have any don't have special needs identified until kindergarten and I think that would be a, a real issue to have some special needs that needed some different um, instruction and then try to keep the rest of the class floating and um, I'm, I'm not in I'm in favor of option two I think I like I'm sorry, I, I just don't think parents are gonna like it either I know I wouldn't yeah, I think I like about option two is it's a solution that fits the school year and gives us time to figure out how to manage the future. So is it a bubble, is it a trend mm -hmm. in terms of where the students are being located? I think we have to continue to consider how we expand the dual language program as part of that future thinking. Uh, this is a good short-term solution. We're not making long-term decisions. We're meeting the needs of the students. Um, I, as a parent of a future kindergartner I would, I would not be happy with 32 students in my classroom I, I might consider other options mm -hmm. so I think that um, and even with a teacher assistant wouldn't I still would be disappointed I think a strong preference for adding an additional classroom I agree I, I, it, it's unfortunate that that we're looking at this in July and again in August before the school year starts that's the that's the in my opinion the unfortunate part of it um, but I think that to put the to put a, a kindergarten class together with 30 kids even if you're breaking it looks to me it, you can correct me if I'm wrong but the TA solution is a small group of students so you're still gonna have a full-size kindergarten class with kids bopping in and out and you know it, it, we've all been in a kindergarten classroom at one point or another they can be less than um, organized at times and I think having that kind of rotation in and out but could potentially make it even worse mm -hmm. and, and more difficult and also to Judy's point it is so critical for those teachers to have a very close look at every student there's no way they can monitor 30. It's a critical year in your development really you're is. going from preschool I know yeah. that you know some kids developmentally emotionally aren't ready or they're close or uh, educationally aren't you know, so it's a really critical year the ratio of the teacher to student in kindergarten is one of the most important years it's a big socialization period and it's really really important and from looking at this all of the Miller um, students are opting for full day <coughs> right okay so that's another right. thing you've got kids who 
might Can't have even do been a half in, day, half day. Maybe, but but they might have not been in preschool. Now all of a sudden you got a full day. Even if they were in preschool, it's not every day. So, um, yeah. It's a big transition time. You're right. It's a huge transition. The, I just um, hopefully when we get the report back with you know some projections on on census going forward, we can take the time necessary and develop the right plan for the, the following year and, and a longer term look at it. I, I feel like this is a great solution. It's a really good looking Band-Aid. It's not a, you know, unfortunately we're not in a position where we can make a long term decision and we need to because there's, we have, not only do we have the issue with the dual language program, but we have the issue with census numbers that go up and down. And so we just have to have that preparation in place so that we can flip switches as necessary. So it seems as though we have right. a definite consensus here. So I guess the other thing, and, and, and Rick brought this up too, this whole started with the dual language program and what were we going to do with that. Mm -hmm. So where are we on that? Well, the, So, I mean, this was a side right. piece to that. Well, so, as, as Rick pointed out, this, this year we're moving forward with uh, the, the current plan. We're, we, we're waiting to see after registration and then, uh, families on the wait list will be notified if their child will be in the dual language program. But then we do, um, the plan is to t use next year then to look long term. Obviously, initially when we did the dual language program, every student that wanted to get in got in. And now we're, we're kind of over that hump now and it's gaining popularity. And, and so now we're, we're anticipating that we're every year now going forward, we're going to have the same issue. So uh, part of that um, long range planning in terms of what we're going to see with enrollment is also uh, accounting a growing uh, dual language program. A couple things that I was thinking about, especially with um, registration coming up. So, so at registration, if you've got a family coming in, they just can't get in the dual language program, right? Right. So, right. Um, right. so I, what we're going to probably have to do, <coughs> obviously, somebody who's in charge of this would have to explain how the dual language program like you have to have x number of spanish speaking and x number right. of english speaking and if you don't have that you don't right, have class. right. um so that could be something that falls under the pr piece mm -hmm. or right. uh, person right. in charge of that and that right. would probably be good to have for registration because a lot of people have been talking about our dual language program it's great i mean mm -hmm. in some ways it's a great problem to have but i think now it's it's up to us to make sure that people right. understand what that means. Right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. definitely. Okay. And you know, oh, I'm sorry. well, I was going to say again, <clears throat> what's transpired in, in uh, basically a few years. I don't know if you remember during registration, we're actively recruiting families for dual language um, because we were just trying to, to get enough numbers in there to warrant the class. And, um, and as you're suggesting now, somebody who is truly new to the district and walks in on August 7th, right, they don't have that option. You know, they would have had to notify us back in April when we had kindergarten registration. I think that's one of the things we have to sort out over the course of the next school year. Better yet, by, um, you know, by January, is to know how we're going to handle Mm -hmm. dual language right. overflow and if we're going to I, we're going to ask people to react to um, a desire for a program that may not have a space for them and we're going to have to ask them to do x y and or z in order to be in that we need we need to shape those expectations right. Right. well in advance right. well in advance so and I, I, I kind of go back to where we started months ago I just did the math. It looks like 15 out of 42 students are interested in dual language at, at Miller, which is 36%. And Manning is 14 out of 65, which is 22%. I think Miller is drawing families that want to move into the school district. And so if that's a draw, creating capacity for them so that they can participate is going to be important because if they bought right. intending to do dual language, that's going to be a problem for those that moved in or right. denied. So. I agree. We, it's a not a good solution for the current year for dual language, but long term we've got to think through mm -hmm. how to meet those needs. If people are moving into Miller to, to be part of the dual language, yeah. Um, the other thing too that I want to talk talk about sooner rather than later is 
the way people would get in because I think it was right now first come first serve or if you have siblings or whatever and the only well I have a number of issues with that like there are families who um, let's say like always are in the front row for every right, right. event and so you right. have people who are Johnny on the spot on everything but what if you have a family that two people work and there's a lot of things going on and maybe by the time they hear about it and then it's closed mm -hmm. so I, I struggle with the first come first serve because maybe the people who need it the most wouldn't hear about it right so I'm really interested to have a another conversation again mm -hmm. real real mm -hmm. real soon right, right. Um, because obviously what we just these are just numbers on a paper but each one of these mean a child mm -hmm. and so there are some people who are not going to be getting in this program who want to be and so I think it's we have to shift from where we were right. obviously right. to looking for children to be in the program to now what do we do how do we do this so um, again I, I would I'm gonna write it on our calendars that we can if we can start talking about this you know right in September or something well, and I, I'm anticipating August we're going to be looking at the projections okay which will start that conversation okay. but I agree I think you know each month at the beginning of this new year um, this has to be part of our discussion yeah. on a regular basis um, until we kind of you know develop that plan create that plan so that um, before we hit that you know as soon as we hit January we're already Right. Gearing up for mm -hmm. the upcoming year, you know, we're having staffing discussions. We're looking at those things, so we need to have that information and a plan in place. Um, and, that, that. and I think that's part of the problem. Why? Why it's July? I mean, th these kids didn't just all move in, mm -hmm. so it's a um, it's very unfortunate that we're in this position now in July to have Michael run around find chairs yeah. and all that stuff well, and get a room ready and and one of the things possibly again, you know, put on a, on the list of to look at um, is our guidelines because it, it does uh, specify in our guidelines that you know final enrollments will review by August 1st to determine if there's a need to hire additional staff and uh, that's partly because it's it is tied to kindergarten registration registration all those things um, yeah and so now, we're yeah you know if right you know then if if one of the things one of the things that we've learned is okay we might have to look at some of these timelines move them up sooner so that um, we're not having the discussion now can we also look historically at enrollment numbers the day before the final registration mm -hmm. date and the day after mm -hmm. and um, so that we have a i mean i can't we always say oh we'll pick up two or three more or oh, we'll pick up one or two more at registration that's great but I, i'm sure there's historical precedence to this if we were to look back 10 years and take an average we're going to find out we had 2.3 or whatever you know whatever it is right and we can plan accordingly and then the anomaly year is the anomaly year yeah. and that's always going to be there but you know I, I'm a law of averages guy so I just I think if we look at the law of averages on this we're going to be able to, to have a better plan the other the other thing I wanted to say I'm sorry to interrupt is that um, I think by September we should probably or or between September and October um, we probably should be talking to some other whether it's districts that have high demand low enrollment type of programs whether they're gifted programs second language pro programs whatever type of program it is and also maybe even consider talking to um, schools that are specifically set up for specific enrollment numbers only with a higher demand for that enrollment and see what those right. policies and, and mm -hmm. kind of programs are to figure out who's wh where the selection is made and, and it may assist us instead of trying to reinvent the wheel. No, that, yeah, definitely we'll be doing that. I, I want to go back, and there's two issues, Marie, you're right. One is the Miller versus Manning and the allocation where the students are, but there's no scenario that I think that we, based on the, the demographic of our students and those that are Spanish-speaking first language, we couldn't have done more than we're going to offer. And so, you know, that's going to take some creativity to mm -hmm. think through how we expand it because right. if we could meet the needs of the 29 students that could be two classrooms you know so i just i want to be creative in how we approach right. this solution you know this problem and 
Again, I think that what the solution you, you provided, number two, is going to work for this year where it's going to have some disappointed families. Mm -hmm. We couldn't have met their needs without more Spanish-speaking students right, anyways. Right. That's part of the challenge as well. I, and yeah, and so it's like, I will admit, I will admit this, that um, until this whole thing came up, I don't know that I fully understood how it all went. Mm -hmm. I just thought, you know, you go in dual language class. So I, I'm probably sure that there's other parents that feel the same way. So I think it's for, we have to tell people what a dual language class looks like, what you need to have a dual language program, how it works and all that, uh, in addition to just, you know, I mean, I've heard families that want to move here because, you know, we have a dual right. language. Well, except what if you don't know? So mm -hmm. anyway. Um, we should also talk with the, our dual language instructors and the administrators closely associated with it to see if there are and I know they presented different programs, basically. You know, there's other programs available for dual language. It doesn't have to be a 50-50 split. Right. Maybe we look at doing what we can do to be as inclusive in the program as possible, even though it might provide, I, I, I didn't feel like it was going to provide a lesser experience, but I think it may have broadened the, the tenure of the experience. Mm -hmm. You know, you might not end in grade five where we were ending now but if we can engage more it would excite students about learning and, and expose them to that as well so it may not be the perfect mix but maybe we need to find a great mix that works really well mm -hmm. um, one last thing and Kevin this is just um, I think probably one of the reasons we had August 1st is because we used to have our uh, registration I think in July. you're right I think you're right so we'll probably yeah. need to just change that um, but I wanted to make sure everybody had this so you can see this and again I, I was very happy when we came up with this because this is so much better than we had before and in, in DuPage County I think this is a healthy number mm -hmm. and then I saw this other thing so I'm just yep. passing that around sure. also because it's we're kind of close right. so um, okay so let's just uh, recap. So you'll you will um, we'll be posting talk for with Tim and right, we'll right. get started on all that right. and we'll then post it um, and then get that process done so that we're yeah okay so we have consensus as a board that that's the direction we want to take and then we can do an official approval in August. So mm -hmm. you don't think we should do something to have a special board meeting? We and then just for right. people that don't know, we can't add an action item tonight if it's not posted. Um, and, but. And, and really, it does, the action item is the hiring of the person. Yes. You know? So right now we don't have okay. anybody recommend it. But we do have, um, if, if it looks like time of, of the essence, um, depending upon the candidate, they may, their situation may, re may require that they hours. want to be hired sooner, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a special board meeting. It's only a few days earlier, but um, there's a special board meeting on that Friday. Um, to do oh, the superintendent right, evaluation. Right, the 17th. 17th, yeah. Oh, it's after the board meeting. I thought we were before. No, it's the 17th. 17th? Okay. All right. What about well, the four families that we've already reached out to and given them the offer of going to Manning? What if they want to go to Manning regardless of our decision tonight? Or um, you know, I'll, I'll talk to uh, to Tim, and, um, you know, that that's kind of up to the board. I mean, I don't know necessarily. Um, I think the reason why it's kind of what Rick had, had said, I think, what the, why they were considering the move is more they were looking at the numbers in, in that kindergarten class so this solves that problem for them so i it would not surprise me if now they're completely content with remaining there and was it is it was it an offer or was it a a consideration like would you consider doing this or was it will you do this so i wonder if we even offered the opportunity or just asked if they I, i'll have to check for sure with tim how he phrased it but it was Tim that reached out to. Because uh, I mean, I don't know where these families live. I don't know sure. whose families these friends are. are. I mean, they, for all, for all intents and purposes, the, they could be living one block apart, but they, because they cross a boundary, they're going to Miller and they're going to Manning. Maybe right. they want, I mean, I don't know. That's all right. I'm, all I'm right. saying. And, right. Could you, um, it's Tuesday. Could you um, talk to Tim and, mm -hmm. do all the, and then yeah. let us know just sure. in the board update on Friday, just so sure. we're aware of what, where this goes. Mm -hmm. and stuff, so. yep. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on it? Okay, we are removing the um, policy first reading uh, because the uh, policy committee has not met yet. So we will hopefully do that next month. Um, presentation of monthly financial statements. 
Hey, um, I'm uh, going to talk about the May financial statements this evening. Um, during the month of May, the district received uh, $205,000 from the state. $120,000 of that was for general state aid for the year. Um, the state has vouchered $203,000 of fiscal year 18 payments that have not been released, and the state owes the district for two quarters of the mandated categorical pre uh, payments at this point. That has not been their typical practice. Usually by now they only owe us for one, although um, they did owe us for two quarters last year as well. Um, the district um, received the first installment of the 2017 um, tax levy during the month of May in the amount of $848,000, which is uh, represents 3.59% of the levy. So um, this is the first year, I think, ever that we have received um, tax installments in the month of May. And that is because of the tax legislation change. So a lot of tax property taxpayers paid their taxes early in December 2017 because of the new tax law change. And so this payment represents those early taxes. So what that's ultimately going to do, I didn't anticipate getting, you know, additional revenue. So our revenues will be greater by the end of the fiscal year than I have projected um, for that. Um, in the ad and tort funds, revenues are higher than the prior year average. Again, um, we received $204,000 um, from the state in the ed fund, and there are $84,000 of payments vouchered but that we haven't received yet. Um, revenues in the O&M fund are comparable to prior year. And um, in the transportation fund, revenues again fluctuate year to year based on the timing of state payments. So the percentage is higher this year because we received the fourth quarter FY17 this year. And then also with um, the additional tax payments, that's also causing um, it to be greater. And then um, the state has vouchered and, um, almost $19,000 um, that hasn't been released, and that's for the third quarter payment. They have not vouchered the fourth quarter payment yet. And then expenditures in the Ed Fund are comparable to the prior year. Um, the O&M fund, again, fluctuates year to year based on the type of projects we have. So uh, the O&M fund is 76.3% spent um, to date this year, and it was 71% spent at the same time last year. And then in the transportation fund, again, the timing of um, receipt of invoices and payments for those um, causes uh, significant variations. Um, we have received and we're um, you know pretty much caught up in May with all of our transportation bills. And so um, the percentage spent to date uh, this year is comparable to 2014-15 before we started having all those lags. And then um, I've also attached um, the um, investments. We have $11 million um, invested um, for the district at this point in time. And then the activity um, accounts are uh, attached and then um, also uh, ending fund balances. So total fund balance at the end of May is $11.5 million for all funds. Does anybody have questions? Are we the fund balance last May? Um, I don't have that with me right at the is, moment. Is it comparable? Um, typically there, because May is typically low point fund balance before you receive taxes. Um, so we typically get our first installment of taxes in June. And um, I can look that up and get back to you. Obviously with the early tax payments, we're holding or uh, investing dollars, holding on to that, knowing that we're, if we got paid early on, something we're not going to get paid later. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and it just flows over into fund balance for next year. So Perfect. it'll, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, anything else? Okay, thank you. So now we'll move on to action items. Um, the chair will entertain a motion to authorize and direct the treasurer to pay any bills received in July of 2018 that have been budgeted for the current or prior fiscal year as presented. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Rudy. Yes. Mr. Stromeyer. Yes. Ms. Wilson. Yes. Mr. Armstrong. Yes. Mrs. Charlton. Yes. Thank you. The next item is approval of the purchase of a cargo van. 
The chair will entertain a motion to approve the cargo van purchase with Curry Commercial Center in the amount of $34,791 as presented. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Strawbyer. Yes. Ms. Wilson. Yes. Mr. Armstrong. Yes. Mr. Rudy. Yes. Mrs. Charlton. Yes. Thank you. The next item is approval of the purchase of a lift gate for cargo van. The chair will entertain a motion to approve the lift gate purchase for the cargo van with regional truck equipment in the amount of $7,263 as presented. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Ms. Wilson. Yes. Mr. Armstrong. Yes. Mr. Rudy. Yes. Mr. Stromeyer. Yes. Mrs. Charlton. Yes. Thank you. The next item is approval of the purchase of a John Deere mower. The chair will entertain a motion to approve the John Deere mower with sn with snow blower purchase with Deere and Company through Shorewood Home and Auto as the participating dealer in the amount of forty two thousand seven hundred and sixty four dollars and twenty eight cents as presented. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Armstrong. Yes. Mr. Rudy. Yes. Mr. Stromer. Yes. Ms. Wilson. Yes. Mrs. Charlton. Yes. Thank you. And the last one is approval of the purchase of a trailer for the John Deere mower. The chair will entertain a motion to approve the trailer purchase for the John Deere mower with Bobcat of Rockford, not to exceed $5,000 as presented. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Rudy. Yes. Mr. Stromeyer. Yes. Ms. Wilson. Yes. Mr. Armstrong. Yes. Mrs. Charlton. Yes. Okay. okay the next item, uh, superintendent's report. Uh, in my report, um, we've uh, touched on registration a couple of times, but uh, just to let our families know that registration for the 2018-19 school year will take place on August 7th from 2 o'clock p.m. until 8 o'clock p.m. at Westmont Junior High. And uh, families, regardless of what uh, school your child will be attending or what age your children are, um, we have district registration at one site. So um, regardless, you will attend the registration at the junior high on August 7th. And just a reminder that uh, families do have to prove residency every year and the uh, parents can check the district website for a list of documentation required. And that the Skyward online pre-registration open today at two o'clock p.m. and that will remain open until uh, August 6th. And then it's um, closed so that that data can be rolled over in time for registration. Um, would you just, and if, it's August and if families are on vacation or they can't be there that day, contact the district office. Correct, correct, or their child's building. Yeah, I um, uh, took that link today and put it on some of our oh. district Facebook yeah. pages so that people could see it. Mm -hmm. And with just a caveat, like contact the, mm -hmm. you know, because you know, some people right. aren't around. So. Right. That's okay. my report. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any board reports? Uh, I just have one. Um, it's, it's becoming a tradition now, and I, I think it's wonderful. But last Saturday at the uh, Taste of Westmont, the Westmont High School Jazz Band was invited to perform again on the main stage at 2 o'clock. And it, it was uh, quite a sight to see these, uh, obviously, all volunteer time from the kids. Uh, the, the teacher, Hank Vaughn, was there, uh, uh, you know, conducting and playing. Um, because you know the kids are kind of thrown together they haven't played together in six or seven weeks they sounded just awesome but uh, I'd like to give a special shout out to uh, Mark Roslin he's one of the parents and uh, um, they only had one trombone player my daughter and she reached out to an eighth grade student the the, the son Tim Roslin and uh, Tim got his father to play too so it was quite a sight to see the you know the family up there most of the Roslins on the stage with their daughter Amanda so uh, but the band was just great and it, it's uh, it's great to see so thank the village thank the WSEC thank everybody involved for getting those kids on the stage it's it's quite awesome to see them perform on a, on a, on a real stage mm -hmm. you know uh, so okay any other board reports to share okay so future meeting and events as we talked about registration for all schools August 7th from 2 to 8 at Westmont Junior High School. And the next school board meeting will be August 14th at 7 o'clock at the Westmont Village Hall. The chair will entertain a motion to enter closed session for the purpose of discussing personnel issues and the sale or lease of property. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Stromeyer. Yes. Ms. Wilson. Yes. Mr. Armstrong. Yes. Mr. Rudy. Yes. Mrs. Charlton. Yes. Thank you. And there will not be a vote after closed. So.